preservation of and increased access to the 92nd Street Y Humanities Audio Archives is generously funded by the National Endowment for the Humanities. Good evening. My name is John Ruskay. As Director of Education at the Y, it's my pleasure to welcome you both to the Y and to this opening evening of our series, Critics on Criticism Film. Critics on Criticism colon Film. I hope you won't mind if I take but a moment for a special announcement. This series on film criticism is part of a growing segment of Y programs which concern themselves with the humanities. Some of these lectures and film evenings have substantial Jewish content. Others, like this series on film criticism, and others we present on subjects which annually include economics, foreign policy, the media, and architecture, are designed for the broader community. Many of this country's leading scholars and public figure, figures come to the Y to participate in these evenings. This year's lecturers include, for example, economist Henry Kaufman, Zbigniew Brzezinski, Metropolitan Opera Maestro James Levine, architect I.M. Pei, and Elie Wiesel, who recently completed his 17th annual series of lectures. To make certain that we can continue to enrich and expand these programs, and in order to assure that these programs will endure, the Y is establishing a $3 million program endowment. The National Endowment for the Humanities recently awarded the Y a $500,000 challenge grant, both to endorse the Y's programming record to date and to assist in this endowment drive. Each government dollar must be matched by three private dollars. Need I say that your participation in this campaign is both invited and will be deeply appreciated. To make it easy, we have provided you with an envelope which, when filled, will enable you to become a partner with us to make certain that these programs continue to grow. We hope you will join with us in this effort. Thank you. For your information, there are a few tickets remaining for two of the remaining three evenings of this series. Tickets are available for the evening with Jack Kroll on February 6, and with Pauline Kale on March 5. Unfortunately, the evening with Rex Reed on February 27th could not be moved to this hall, and therefore is completely sold out. Tickets for the available evenings are available at the Y box office. Regarding the format for this evening's program, following the moderated conversation on stage, you will be able to submit written questions on the index cards which you received as you entered the hall. Please pass your cards to the center aisles. In about 45 minutes, ushers will collect the cards and bring them backstage for presentation. We're very pleased to have with us Dr. Annette Insdorf as moderator for this evening and the entire series, Critics on Criticism. Dr. Insdorf is Associate Professor at Columbia and Yale Universities, where she has been teaching film history and criticism since 1975. She is a frequent contributor to the Sunday New York Times Arts and Leisure section, and her articles have appeared in numerous publications, including Film Comment, The Los Angeles Times, American Film, and Yale French Studies. Dr. Dr. Insdorf is the author of Francois Truffaut, a critical study of the director's films, which was public, published by William Morrow in 1979, and most recently, Indelible Shadows, Film in the Holocaust, written with the assistance of a Rockefeller Foundation Fellowship and published by Random House to critical acclaim. While there are many more credits, which I might mention at this time, let me say that for both the lay and professional leadership of the Y, it is a special treat to have Dr. Insdorf with us for this series with film critics and a second series entitled The Holocaust, Guilt and Responsibility, which begins on Thursday evening, January 26. And Annette, a frequent participant in major Y programs during the past few years, uniquely combines intelligence, eloquence, and charm. We are very grateful that she is with us. Our special guest this evening is the film critic of the New York Times, Vincent Canby. Born in Chicago, 
a graduate of Dartmouth College, Vincent Camby is an author, playwright, and outstanding film critic. He is the author of Unnatural Scenery, which, which was published in 1979 by Knopf, End of the War, a play produced by the Ensemble Studio Theater in 1978, and Living Quarters, which Knopf published in 1975. After all, a program of three one-act plays was produced at the Manhattan Theater Club in 1981. Upon graduation from Dartmouth, Vincent Camby began his career in journalism as a general reporter and assistant to the drama critic of the Chicago Journal of Commerce, which he left in 1950 to do public relations work. In 1951, he joined the motion picture Herald, where he was a reporter until he joined Variety in 1959 as a motion picture reporter and critic. Mr. Canby joined the Times in December 1965 as a reporter in the Cultural News Department and was appointed chief film critic of the New York Times in 1969. Now completing his 15th year as film critic of the Times, he is recognized as one of the deans of film criticism in this country. We are honored to have Vincent Canby with us this evening to open this series. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming our moderator, Dr. Annette, Annette Insdorf, and our guest, Vincent Camby. Good evening, everyone. I'm going to start off with some very nuts and bolts, gritty questions like, how many films do you see a year? Well, somebody asked me that about an hour ago, and I, I've forgotten what I said then. Uh, I think it usually comes out to about, I see about 200. And about and review about 130 to 150. But uh, it's so it's, and when I take four weeks or five weeks off vacation, it comes out almost to one a day. So it's a, it's a lot of movies. Do you prefer to see them in the nice plush screening rooms that they give us critics, or do you prefer sometimes to go to the actual movie houses where the situation of the screening changes? Uh, you probably could answer that. Uh, I want you to. Uh, well, actually, we're required uh, as often as possible to see them in screening rooms because the reviews are uh, supposed to run the day the film opens. Uh, there are a number, an increasing number of films now that, that aren't screened in advance, so, which means that we are given the choice assignment of going to some place on 42nd Street about 9 o'clock on a Friday morning and seeing a horror film. <laughs> and uh, you can't always tell the difference between what's happening in the audience <laughs> and, uh, and what's going on, on the screen. <laughs> so uh, actually I do, uh, most of the films that I don't actually review, I catch after they've opened in theaters. And a bit of that's important, I think, to uh, you know, see how films play. I, I did not review, for instance, Educating Rita and it was playing at the New Yorker Theater, which is right across the street from where I live. And I hadn't heard much about it. And after about five weekends of seeing crowds stretching around the block, I thought I'd better check it out, <laughs> which I did. Uh, uh, and that, that was an experience, because it was a film I really didn't like very much, but it was very interesting to see how the audience loved it and responded to it. Uh, <laughs> it was educating. <laughs> Now, if you could describe your projected or ideal re reader, I mean, who is it in a way that you're writing for? Does he or she look like you, have the same tastes as you, or are you trying to do a different I thing? think that's uh, something you should never even think about, because if you do, then you start writing uh, perhaps to fit somebody else's uh, frame of mind. And when you start doing that, you wind up writing a lot of drivel, I think. You've got to... Uh, analyze your own responses as clearly and as honestly as possible and let the, you know, let the chips fall where they may, to coin a phrase. Uh, if once you start worrying about uh, whether what you're writing is going to mean anything to particular readers, you're lost because you're searching then, you're trying to, uh, you're trying to please somebody and you, that person, that one particular person doesn't really exist. You're writing for several hundred thousand people and no one of them is any more or less important than the other, and you can't write for every one of them. Mm -hmm. That's true. Now, 
from your reviews, one gets the feeling that you particularly prize comedy, and especially the kind of darker satiric thrust of films like uh, Zelig, The Right Stuff, King of Comedy, Britannia Hospital, The Big Chill. And I was wondering, is this simply because you like to laugh, uh, or you, you, do you find irony is particularly appropriate to our age? Or is it that you believe that audiences still go to the theater to a great extent to laugh? I mean, are these things uh, blended for you? I don't think I've ever you know, thought about liking comedy more or less than anything else. Uh, the films you mentioned are all films that I like, but I don't think of them especially as comedies. I think of them as very good films. Uh, there are some that you, several that you mentioned are very particular, very peculiar films, like Britannia Hospital, which is a, a, a vicious kind of uh, satire, but also works as farce for me, which is one sees very seldom in, in movies. Farce somehow just doesn't work very well in movies. Uh, I don't think I, I you know, respond any more or less to comedy than, uh, than what are, and some other genre. I'd like to see a good Western. I haven't seen a good Western in years. I know they haven't made any, or they've made a few that weren't very good, but uh, you know, it's, not, it's not a question of looking for a particular kind of film. It's a question of you know, seeing a film that's good and re being able to respond to it no matter what it is, whether it's uh, uh, Woody Allen and Zalik, which I think is extraordinary, or, uh, oh, let's see, Fanny and Alexander. Uh, which is not exactly a comedy. Not exactly a knee slapper, no. no. But, uh, <laughs> Actually, it is funny in smart, but... Uh, so. Okay. Um, the other question that a lot of people, I think, want to know, to answer, is uh, who determines whether it's you or Janet Maslin who reviews a given film? Do you work it out between the two of you? Is it an assignment? Well, there's a funny answer and a serious answer. I'm bigger than she is. <laughs> uh, no, we work it out together, and it, it often depends on... Uh, what our schedules are in any one week, because we usually see films uh, not too long before they open. We're not like the uh, magazine critics who have a very early deadline. And because of that, we sometimes get very, uh, our schedules get very full a week or two before the opening of a particular film, and it's whoever is available. However, we do talk about it, because there are some films I know that she will feel more positively about that is the, the subject or whoever made it or who's in it may be people they may, there may be people that she is interested in and thus will write better about and write more fully and with more uh, interest and passion than I will uh, and we try to uh, divide films often along those lines because it's there's it's uh, not fair to a film to send somebody off to it whom you know in advance will probably have a negative uh, opinion no matter how good it is. Um, this week for, and this coming week, uh, we had an interesting sort of uh, discussion about the new Woody Allen. Now, I, Zalig came out just about six months ago. Mm -hmm. And I really, uh, and I admire that film terrifically and I admire Woody Allen terrifically. And I think it's about time maybe that, that Janet should review uh, Broadway Danny Rose, which is a new Woody Allen film because I think I've, I've sort of written about Woody, as much as I have to say, or I've said all I can say for a while, and I think Janet has a lot of new stuff that would be far more interesting than my replaying, uh, if it's good, you know, the, the same old uh, themes which I've touched before. Now, if you uh, occasionally want to read other critics on films, do you have any particular favorites? Are there people that you admire and respect? And uh... I really don't read I don't have time to read that many other people. I read the film magazines, the you know, film comment and uh, American film. I uh, I read Andrew Saras a lot because he's a friend, and uh, and I I think he's got one of the best minds of anybody I know, and we frequently disagree, and which makes it more fun. But Andrew has got one of the most stimulating minds when he's uh, of any film critic writing today. As I say, even though we, we frequently disagree, but it's great fun and for me to read them. We never talk about films, or very seldom. We sit with each other often at, at screenings, which is kind of amusing because, 
In fact, I saw a film with him this afternoon, and uh, he has a marvelous way of giggling throughout. <laughs> and uh, and I've, I've, uh, this is not, um, he's a dear friend, and I'm not telling a tale, but then he's likely to stand up at the end and say, well, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> But he's a great audience, and that's the that's another very appealing thing about him. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. These days, uh, some of us who've been reading the theater ads in the Times know that you've got another identity surfacing, namely that of playwright, because your play, The Old Flag, is being performed in New Jersey. Um, I was wondering if for you, writing plays, and for that matter, stories, novels, is that a complementary act, partly because after writing criticism about other people's work, sometimes one feels a little bit... Uh, I'm speaking personally now. One feels almost parasitic at times. Um, is this something that you feel you have to keep doing in order to keep writing criticism? Would you like to write more plays? I, I'd love writing more plays or more novels. It's, I don't know that there's, there's that great a difference in, the, in, the, in what one does in either doing fiction or journalism. Uh, because fiction, good fiction, I think, whether it's uh, for the theater or a novel, is a is a kind of criticism. It's a, and the impulse to do it is uh, often, I think, uh, tightly bound up with how you feel about the way the world is going. Uh, it's not, I mean, not that I write socially or politically self-conscious fiction, but it, it does have that impulse, and I don't I don't think there's that much difference. Uh, of course, it's terrifically. Uh, Oh, exhilarating to do your own work and not to always be uh, tied to the uh, to the work of others. That doesn't mean that you can't be quite as I think you can be as as inventive or, or as original in writing criticism as you can in fiction. It's what you, you know. I, I think the good critic ideally should have a vast interest in in life and what's happening in the world around him. And I think the best critics always have. They've always, uh, and well, there have been a few who've even, uh, for a brief period of time, have been very effective critics in the art form that they later you know, became stars themselves in. I think mostly of uh, G.B. Shaw, whose uh, drama criticism is the, among the best ever written. And, Partially not because he knew exactly the kind of theater he wanted to see come into being, and uh, his his reviews, which are mostly quite short, are so vividly written that one can read them today, and though you've never heard of the player or the performers, get as great a charge from as you might reading uh, somebody writing about uh, Silkwood today. I mean that that is the key. That if you can do that. You're sure. a good critic. Or even a more recent example, perhaps the French New Wave directors yes, yes, who were all right. film but critics. But I don't know that I'd first. want to go back and read all their criticism again. Uh, <laughs> they did a very, they did remarkable work and they certainly shook up all of us, including American critics, and they did a, re a fine job. Yeah, and it's interesting that when, for example, Francois Truffaut publishes the collection of his film criticism called The Films in My Life, most of those articles are very affectionate. They're, they're the ones he chose that, where he liked the directors of the films. If you read the Cahiers du Cinéma articles yes, that he wrote in the 50s, ones have been left out. much <laughs> nastier than John Simon or anyone else. <laughs> Curious. <clears throat> in any case, um, it's becoming <coughs> apparent, uh, if you look at the gross receipts on a film every week in Variety, that even a major critic cannot break a box office hit. If a film by Clint Eastwood, I mean, a sudden impact, or staying alive for that matter, can be lambasted by critics, it certainly isn't going to make too much of a difference in the gross. However, you've made it uh, history, in a way, that if a critic like yourself takes on the cause of a small film like Heart Like a Wheel this year, or Stevie a few years ago with Glenda Jackson, that can create the life of a small film. Now, what I was wondering is, since it's not only the readers who end up going to the theaters, but in fact other critics in smaller cities around the country who read if your If they review, ever get the chance to see something like Stevie, because that probably 
never got yeah, that Yeah, the point. In other words, they'll probably read your review before they see Stevie. Mm. So do you sometimes feel a burden going into a small film, knowing that if you don't like it very much, you're in fact perhaps being more responsible for its life or death, or is this I, something no, you can't no, do? You just can't think about that, because uh, if you do, you wind up writing nothing. Again, you, you don't write what you feel. You write what you want to be an, a nice guy, liked by everybody. And after you do that for about two weeks, nobody's going to read you. I mean, we know there's one drama critic who's been, tried to do that for a while, and he's ended up in, the, in a limbo, uh, published every day, but I don't think anybody takes him very seriously. I think he's the same person who once said that you could put a Barbary oh, egg... Yes, yes. Well, that, into that was one of the best things he ever said. It was, I, we're talking about <laughs> Clive Barnes, and somebody asked him about the power of the Times uh, drama critic, and this is when he was really doing very good stuff. And he said uh, he had a feeling that uh, the Times could put a Barbary ape in his job and nobody would know the difference. And that, uh, that was the first and last modest thing I think he ever said. <laughs> <laughs> since uh, you've been the Times critic uh, since 19, well, 15 years already, you've seen a lot of changes in the making of films, also in the distribution and exhibition of films. And I was wondering which changes have struck you the most, either positively or negatively? Well, I don't think there have been that many changes in the, in the making of films, I mean, in the actual way they're made? Well, to the in degree, for example, I think of something that you wrote a few weeks in ago. No, uh, in, in terms of the making of them, for example, you referred to the fact that these days helicopters are the sort of deus ex machina yeah, of all films, yeah. and that it, whenever the attention lags a bit in a movie, boom, bring in the helicopters, yeah. and that films are increasingly being made by, about, and perhaps for robots. And um, that is, for me, a change in the making of the films themselves, given technology's uh, growing visibility. Actually, well, the, the, the technology of films hasn't changed an awful lot. The, the, the use of helicopters is something that I, I think I was drawn or forced to write about after sitting through the Clint Eastwood film, because every other scene starts with the, the camera on a helicopter either landing or taking off. And if you're at all seasick or airsick, <laughs> it's not a movie that, there, nothing really happens in the movie. People get blasted with guns all the time. It's the most static movie I think I've ever sat, sat through. But the, the curious thing about movies is they really haven't changed radically. I mean, the, the basic equipment of, for making movies has not changed really since sound. Color has been refined. Film stock has been refined. Cameras are better. We have a different size film. Sound is better, but the basic uh, equipment of film making hasn't changed and one of these days I think it will and perhaps quite soon when we are if we ever develop a, a kind of tape that will have the definition that we get with 35 or 70 millimeter film but uh, it's amazing how little uh, films have, have, have developed since the 1930s mm. I agree with you, although earlier we, backstage, actually, we were sort of talking about MTV. And uh, I, for one, have been feeling that films like Flashdance and Staying Alive, while they could be considered just as much typical movie musicals with their roots in everything from Fred Astaire uh, on upward, there seems to be a kind of influence from, for example, MTV's popularity and the tie-ins of disco records, the well, I think of that's, that's that, yes. you know, is something that maybe it's not a real change, but it, it makes the films right. a little the, different. The way movies look yeah. it has changed, and also uh, uh, television commercials have had a terrific effect on the way movies look, also how they're cut, how they're edited, and uh, even though uh, we now have all these uh, devices for the, uh, the quick uh, ongoing progression of any film with jump cuts and whatnot, and audiences, we assume, take in a lot more than we assumed 40 or 50 years ago. So even, the, but even with that, curiously, movies are about three times as long as they used to be. You see, uh, uh, it's so many just sort of average, really nice comedies that are two hours long. Well, a two hour long movie in 1936 would have been thought to be an epic. Nobody would, have, you know, unless it had gone with the wind, went three hours and 10 minutes, and people were telling David Selzing, nobody will sit there all that time. And they had an intermission, but that was rare, very rare. True. And even with the, 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 the techniques for telling stories faster, films are slower and longer. <laughs> uh, I agree. And also, I mean, do, do you, 
believe that perhaps as more and more people watch films in their living rooms on videotape, that studios who are putting a lot of money into big budget films, maybe they increasingly feel that you have to give audiences something in the theater that they can't get at home, namely scale, yeah. uh, big technological things, sort of special effects, which on a small screen might not have the same right. power. Yeah. Um, well, I don't know because I think uh, almost all films being made now are, are being made by producers with a consciousness of, of, of that home video market. So I don't think uh, I think we're we're not we're maybe getting fewer and fewer films that really deserve to be played on the big screen. Uh, yet uh, I, I watched the other day a, bar, a part of Gandhi, on a, which is not one of my favorite films, but it had a lot of sort of big scale scenes, and I watched it on a, a home video thing, and the the. Uh, the definition, everything was really quite good. The, the, those big scenes were not necessarily lost. Uh, I, I think uh, as the video equipment becomes better, uh, we will, you know, certainly, uh, mm -hmm. there won't be that difference between the, the uh, what we see on home or expect to see on the small screen and the big screen. Mm -hmm. I think it's too bad because you, I don't know when video equipment will ever be able to show, show us uh, Oh, the Magnificent Ambersons or Citizen Kane, and, you know, which are black and white, with all the marvelous gradations between black and white. And deep focus. Yes. And you, you just don't see that on a television screen, even a good one. If indeed, in about 20 years, let's say, video discs, video cassettes, VCRs, beta, everything else, become the norm, do you think that's going to change the role of the film critic? In other words, Either does one become more obsolete, or does a film critic's role change because it becomes a question of purchasing for the family? I, I, I'm wondering well, what it's going to look like. Well, I wonder if uh, the people really will be purchasing films. I think the, the rental of films will certainly go up. And I, I assume that there, there will always be a few first-run theaters, if possible, in major cities where, where, the, uh, where the more important films of any year will make their debut, I don't know. It may, I think that uh, producers n realize that uh, unless they have something like a, a John Travolta who's pre-sold and have something that's also pre-sold like Grease 2, uh, which was a terrible movie, I guess Travolta wasn't in it, but something comparable, what was it like, Staying Alive? Yeah, uh, and then there's also Two of a Kind. That the, those those are films that could go right into cassettes and you know home video or cable or something, uh, but there will always be other films, and which will have to play off more slowly, because they will be for whatever reason not you know uh, they are properties that people are are going to want to see right away. They they will need the the momentum of some kind of acclaim, some kind of popularity before they can uh, go be distributed widely on video cassettes. Something like Chariots of Fire wouldn't, you know, that would have sunk in a minute if, if the only outlets were uh, home video machines. Nobody would have bought that film. No, so that, that I think the producers will, uh, will support theaters as a necessary adjunct to their business. But I think theaters, as most of us have, have known them, you know, in smaller cities, in suburbs, those are the ones that will probably go. And you actually mentioned recently the problem of all these uh, twinning and quadrupling yes, of theaters, yeah. namely that the theaters that some of us knew in our childhood, like I knew the Lowe's Paradise on the Grand Concourse, these theaters either no longer exist or they've been turned into the duplexes and quadruplexes and whatever else. That, of course, changes the nature of film going too. And I wonder to what extent the question of exhibition isn't narrowing out the numbers of films. Well, well I guess I wrote something a couple of weeks ago about yeah. that because of these, uh, the, whether they're old fashioned theaters like Lowe's Paradise, which cut up, or brand new multiplexes and shopping malls, the total effect is totally neutral and usually rather uh, in, well, uninteresting environment. And, and often not one that's not well maintained. They're filthy a lot of the times. If it's an old theater that's been chopped up, uh, you, I think what used to be the DeMille is now about four theaters on Broadway. Well, they've just run a wall down the middle of the uh, old auditorium. 
so that the, the, the arc that was the original arc of seats in the orchestra is just cut off in the middle. So half the audience, when you go into this half of the theater, you're looking at the side wall. You aren't even, you're not, you have to bend to look at the, the screen, which is that way. Uh, what, your, what your seat is aimed at the, the edge of a screen that no longer exists. Yeah, given those And also the walls, the, the insulation between these places are, is usually pretty poor. And if you get a, a loud movie you know, in one theater, you're often listening to it uh, while watching the other, which is not super. No, and I'd almost rather watch it on television yeah. than see it in those conditions. Um, you've remarked that there's a kind of dearth of originality in many American films, especially now that we have all these sequels and remakes and imitations. And yet, for example, I've noticed that you have praised films like To Be or Not To Be, the remake of The Lubitsch. You've even praised a film that I personally did not like, The Man Who Loved Women, which is a remake of I Our Man Who Loved Women. Qualification. Yeah, uh, yeah, but it was basically uh, yeah. praise. Now, my, my question was. Um, <laughs> To what extent would it be possible to urge for re-release of the classic films? I mean, wouldn't it be preferable in a way for the money that's spent to make remakes um, to, to get new prints of, for example, To Be or Not To Be? Um, is that something that you think is important, or does one have to accept that this is going to No, I think if there was an audience that would uh, you know, stand in line, and maybe they would stand in line for the Lubitsch, To Be or Not To Be, which is one of the great films of all time. But... You uh, ask the fellow who runs the Regency, who put on a really remarkable, marvelous retrospective early last year devoted to the work of Preston Sturges. Now, I, that was successful, but I don't think that he made it a fortune. Mm -hmm. And they and there were brand new prints, most of them. The movies, uh, the, the prints were terrific. The movies are classics. It's one of the great shows that we had last year. But uh, uh, Lady Eve, uh, Sullivan's Travels, Christmas in July, great films. But I'm afraid they, they wouldn't draw that big an audience. I don't think that uh, To Be or Not To Be, uh, with great prints and given a, even a big advertising campaign to, in support and all the support in the world from all the critics, would probably do that well. Uh, I'm, I'm, and also, you can, you can get that and show it at home. That is available. In fact, I, I believe there was just a review yesterday of the video cassette of To Be or Not To Be, which is now available for home viewing yeah. so that you can... And it is a great the movie. It's a, I just happen to also like Mel Brooks. And I, the idea of his putting his mitts on that film really upset me a great deal. And then in the first minute and a half, I was on the floor laughing. Well, uh, sweet Georgia uh, Brown done in Polish yes, would yes. do it. <laughs> <laughs> See, but that's, that's one of the reasons that I guess, perhaps erroneously, I associate you more with appreciating com comedy. For example, Woody Allen and Mel Brooks are people that you consistently, I think, have responded to. And uh, even, you know, to go back to this earlier question, even in films that, like Jean-Luc Godard's Every Man for Himself, or some of the films from Poland that have been shown at the New York Film Festival, I remember that you would always bring out the comic element in those films, even well, if they weren't necessarily comic. Well, one of the most moving things about, I think, the work of often of Vita is that the, the, they're very funny in a very dark way. Right. And that's, that's the genius of the man. Uh, it's uh, true of so many, I think, so many great filmmakers, and don't ask me to name one right this second. But it, it, the, obviously the, the, uh, uh, the films of of Godard are very witty films. They aren't films you necessarily laugh out loud at, but they're so bright and they, they just, uh, and it just wakes you up. It's like a cool breath of air watching a good Godard film. Of course, you, you often wind up baffled, but you also are provoked in a way you haven't been by anybody else in a long time. Yeah. Okay, I'll buy that. Okay. <laughs> um, I was also wondering, uh, do you see any particular major problems right now in American film, whether it's the studio system, or do you think that the same problems <coughs> exist now as before, or are there some new things that we have to guard against, either as viewers, as producers, as critics, as actors? I don't quite understand, but... Well, I mean, for example, um, 
the the problem of sequels and remakes yes. is for me yeah. in fact indicative of a problem of perhaps right. this question that there's nothing either people don't have anything new to say or else those who really have something to say aren't getting the chance to make the films in Hollywood because their scripts are not formulaic in mm. other words because mm. they don't fit Clint Eastwood or Burt Reynolds or Mel Brooks for that matter um, I sometimes sense that it's harder to make a film today in Hollywood than it was 20 or 30 years ago when more films I were I just wonder if made. it is. I think uh, it's very easy to, to suspect that things were better 30 years ago. Uh, 30, 40 years ago when the studios were turning out you know, junk by the you know, dozens each day. And uh, in that junk, they were making five or 600 films a year. You might get you know, 10 or 15 very, very good films that we think of as classics today. Uh, we make far fewer films, but I think the, the old impulse to make a fast buck hasn't changed it for the better or worse. It's still the same thing. What, what is frightening is that there are fewer films being made, and when you have fewer films being made, you have fewer chances of original uh, personal movies being made. And when the budgets get so you know, tremendous, uh, the uh, the impulse is also to go as much as possible with what anybody assumes is a, is a property that people are want, going to want to see right from the start, whether it gets good reviews or bad. So that the 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 pressures certainly are towards making films of less and less real interest. And but that's been a a, a, a trend, I guess, or that's been true since the you know, silence started to talk. And actually, on the plus side, you, for example, have been one of the major supporters of independently produced American films, uh, whether it was Heartland or uh, I remember Gal Young in a, yes, um, a few that. years yeah. ago. Now, it seems especially like uh, this week, El Norte, for example, mm -hmm. opened at the Baronet, independent American film getting a major opening. Do you believe that the independent movement is indeed vital enough these days that it can provide either a complementary or alternative um, film viewing experience for us? It all depends because uh, you know every filmmaker is different, uh, and whether the, the the chance or the appearance say of three good independent films within three months of each other uh, will prompt editors and people like me to start seeing trends all over the place and saying, gee, we've got it, this is amazing. But it's just by chance, you'll look into it and find out that one of the films had been made eight years ago, another three years ago, another last year. And there's no uh, rhyme or reason to the way that films uh, get released or perhaps how they're, they're conceived. I hope that the costs of, uh, of filmmaking can be brought down by the use of good eight millimeter equipment, which will make it far easier for people without great budgets to make you know, decent original movies. I don't know that the, it's, I, I should think it would be more difficult today for independent filmmakers than ever before, but we're getting some very good ones. What is interesting is that there are now several good theaters in New York equipped to show 16 millimeter films, which is why we're getting some, not always good ones, but some very interesting films shown upstairs at the Waverly, at the uh, Embassy 72nd Street, and a couple of other houses. And that uh, those outlets simply were not available for 16 millimeter films before, and a lot of independent filmmakers don't have the money to blow up their films from 16 to 35, and thus never get a commercial outlet here. Yeah. I think, in fact, commercially speaking, New York seems to have gotten a bit better over the past few years. I think so. It's there are a, more yeah. houses, for example, right. showing foreign films. Right. And uh, I was wondering, see, about 10, 15 years ago, it seems that the only foreign films that were really playing in New York were French or Italian. I mean, yeah. I, that's Bridget my recollection. Bridget Bardot, that goes back. Yeah, yeah. that too. And um, <laughs> now, of course, we're seeing Polish films and Hungarian films and independent films. We're not, however, to this day, seeing, for example, Spanish films opening. We're not seeing uh, Czech and Yugoslavian films, which continue to be made, although perhaps not with the same distribution. Do you think there's any reason why um, certain countries' films can no, play I here, or is it just quality? purely by accident, because distributors, movie distributors, are, are as greedy as anybody else. And if they think they could make a buck off a film from Albania, they would <laughs> pick it up in a hurry. Uh, that, and also, films, 
we we go in cycles with uh, you know there was the Italian near realist right after World War Two and then uh, the French British Italian. comedies French had their day and then we just recently witnessed the rise of the German film which when I first started writing about uh, films at the time nobody thought it would ever you know make any impression anywhere again after you know the great films of the uh, 30s and the silent films and then suddenly we were just overwhelmed by two or three truly major filmmakers and with Fassbinder gone now I don't know what's going to happen I mean we've been uh, Herzog living I think in California most of the time and well, he's just made a film in Australia I heard. He? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, who knows about Germany as sort of as a film center or filmmaker but as you know especially about the new wave that was sort of a coincidence all the way around there the the members of the new wave but the men we regard as members of the new wave are were all very different kinds of filmmakers and it, it was an accident of history a coincidence of time that they happened to rise up at the same time some were friends but it was an accident as with with what we've witnessed in Germany, I think. It was also a journalistic cachet because apparently the term Nouvelle Vague, New Wave, never emerged from Truffaut or Godard. It was some foreign journalist who called them a New Wave, and it stuck. I think Helen Scott insists she coined that, and I'm not sure she did. Helen Scott. <laughs> this is the woman who collaborated with Truffaut on his great Hitchcock interview book and subtitles most of his films, so it's quite yes. possible <laughs> that, that that was the connection. And of course now we're witnessing the 25th anniversary, if one wants to really put labels on this of the new wave. It's been 25 years since 400 Blows, Breathless, Hiroshima Mon Amour all came out in 1959. And coincidentally enough, we've got opening in New York within the next three months, the new Truffaut film, Confidentially Yours, the new Godard film, uh, first name Carmen, the new René film, Life is a Bed of Roses. And I was wondering if, and also I just read yesterday that Chabrol, another member of the New Wave, is, shooting, is the, uh, uh, shooting The Blood of Others with Jodie Foster in France. Now, have, have, do you feel that in fact these filmmakers, for example, have grown, have in fact lived up to the promise of those early films? Or, but since we you know, picked these arbitrarily, yeah. or do you feel that in fact um, they're just filmmakers now like any other who, who don't necessarily have to be treated with the respect that New Wave might confer upon them. Well, I don't know that uh, there are filmmakers like any others. I mean, they're good filmmakers and not so good filmmakers. And I, have, I think Truffaut and Godard and Chabrol are among the major filmmakers. Uh, René I have some difficulty with from time to time, but he certainly is an interesting filmmaker. Um, I don't, I don't know that uh, we, we respect them any more or less for having been identified 25 mm -hmm. years ago with the new wave. They, uh, they all came out of that period, which was a very healthy, exciting time for filmmakers in France. But I think they, they, they don't really de depend on each other. That's and true. one needn't uh, lump them all together to uh, fully appreciate what they do. But I have noticed some factions in New York among critics and viewers, and it sort of goes into two things. Either you hear there's a new Truffaut film and everybody will run to see it because it's Truffaut. In other words, there's an instantaneous uh, recognition. And then there's another group, and sometimes I'm part of that group, that keeps measuring every new film by any one of these directors against their older work, That's which is... That's a natural thing to do, especially with people that you admire terrifically, because we don't want them ever to do less than they did the last time, which is a terrible burden to put on anybody. Uh, so that uh, uh, when somebody's in a real hot streak, as Truffaut was early on, uh, you, each film is a revelation. You get up, and then up through, uh, I think, uh, Jules and Jim. What came after Jules and Jim? Uh, then he started the, this sort of lower yes, curve which, with and people uh, the start soft saying, skin, he's over, you know, he's over the hill already. Good God, there he goes. That's it. And... Uh, it was, it's a terrible way to look at, at any kind of serious artist. Uh, when uh, Buñuel was on his true role from the time of, uh, I guess, Viridiana, uh, in the 63, I think it was, until his, just maybe the last two films, he was making one extraordinary film after another. He, did see, he, he couldn't do wrong, and he reached a... a 
a peak that was quite extraordinary with uh, uh, the Tristana and the dis uh, discreet charm of the bourgeoisie made when he was, in a, he was 75, 78. Now that's wild. Now, what a great feeling that is to see this man who had been fooling around making some very interesting films in Mexico, but nobody paid much attention to him at the time. And then to see him blossom at that age with first-rate casts, with, with the kind of budgets he needed to do the sorts of films he, he liked to do, although he was not an extravagant filmmaker at all. But he, uh, I mean, it was the impulse when, when uh, after, I guess, uh, discreet charm, was to want to find each new Buñuel film better than the one that had been before, of course, they weren't quite. The, the Phantom of Liberty wasn't the equal of discreet charm, but it was still a, a Buñuel film, and, and to my way of thinking, any Buñuel film, any film by the man who'd made those earlier films is of interest, and is of major interest, and deserves major attention, whether it's better or worse than the last one. Yeah, yeah. I, I feel the same way, but sometimes people yell at me because I say anything by Truffaut or Buñuel is worth checking yeah. out. They go, or tourist. And that, that's, but, but there are certain directors who, do, who deserve that treatment. Others don't. I don't feel that way about Phil Kaufman, who made the right stuff. Well, I like the right stuff, but I, you can't tell me that any film made by him is going to be of the same degree of interest as any film made by, made by uh, Luis Buñuel. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, I'll ask one or two more questions, but would you please uh, send your cards in to the ushers who are going up and down the aisles so that uh, the questions can be put to Mr. Canby? One question I have, um, it's a professional one, is does anyone edit you at the New York Times? In other words, do you have what in film would be called the final cut? Do you have the right to uh, write about anything that you choose, or do you have to sometimes check with editors above you for a Sunday column, let's say, or for a choice? Well, the only a, time uh, I ever check is when I think maybe somebody else is you know, going to be writing about the same thing. Uh, I don't check in advance what I'm going to write about with anybody because half the time I don't know before I sit down to write what it's going to be for a Sunday piece. Uh, they come around very rapidly every seven days. And it's sometimes, you know, rather uh, panicky. On I write them in just a week in advance. And Sunday is usually the blackest day of the week in my house. As I wake up knowing I've got to turn out a certain number of words that day and I have the vaguest notion what it's going to be about, which is a little bit scary. Uh, but uh, as far as our, our, my copy is concerned, it goes through the channels that any copy goes through that goes into the paper, that is read by a succession of editors uh, who I trust will correct my spelling, uh, and they don't always, which is pretty embarrassing. Especially when I hit a word that I don't know how to how to spell. I know I'm not doing it right, so I'll do it two different ways in the same paragraph, and they both get in. <laughs> That's terrible. <coughs> I uh, some years ago, I think it was the first uh, story I ever had on page one of the Times. I was this was before I became a critic. It was when, uh, in 1968, when they were announcing the uh, rating system, and Jack Valetti and uh, a whole bunch of the Motion Picture Association of America people had a big press conference to announce this uh, system by which the production code was thrown out and they were going to rate films according to their content as suitable for whatever audiences. And one of Valetti's uh, choicer phrases was, uh, I'd asked him, what, what, what criteria are you going to use? And he said, we don't worry about criteria. As they come down the chute, we'll rate them. And I took that down in my notes, and I had to get back to the office. It was 5.30, and I had to have my copy in by 6.30. And I couldn't, as I was typing up this quote, I couldn't think of how to, write, how to spell shoot. And I, I, and I was in a frantic hurry, I was sweating, I was, you know, didn't want to miss the deadline. So I just spelled it S-H-O-O-T and thought, <laughs> thought well, there, there, were, there are at least eight editors between me and the front page tomorrow morning. Well, I picked up the front page tomorrow morning and it was S-H-O-O-T. 
It was terrible, but anyway. So. Um, <laughs> You've got to be careful. Yeah. <laughs> Learn how to spell. <laughs> The English teacher in me is responding to this. Um, do you also, do you ever get correspondence from directors whose films you've written about, either positive or negative, that's actually worth talking about now? I mean, do you ever, for example, have to deal with irate responses, or do you ever have to deal with directors who want to meet you because you've written nicely about their films, at which point you have to decide whether that's a good idea? I, it's, uh, I don't think I've ever gotten really irate letters from people whose films I've panned. I think they, they, you know, they may be furious. I got one very peculiar. I had a little correspondence with Ilya Kazan once, but it was not because of, uh, uh, I, was, I was doing a piece, a Sunday piece, which I thought was sort of funny. It was prompted by the, the uh, Pauline Kael's review of Nashville, which she reviewed about uh, two months before it came out. And, I th and it was admittedly uh, not the finished print that she was reviewing and she was raving about it. And I, desperate as usual on a Sunday morning, thought, well, now if we just carry this a little further, you know, we could all sit around and review movies from treatments or from the original novels. And I, uh, uh, at that point, uh, Kazan was working on The Last Tycoon. And I did what I thought was a parody a review of The Last Tycoon, which hadn't even started to shoot, I think, uh, expressing sort of high dudgeon that this uh, film director would put his uh, clumsy hands on this classic American novel when he couldn't even write a novel properly. And it, was, it was really, it was being funny, but I, had a, I shouldn't have done it, actually. I shouldn't have made reference to Kazan's novels. The arrangement, I think, was the last one he'd done. And I got, about two weeks later, received this short and to the point note from, uh, what's the fancy hotel in London? Uh, Claridge's or? Uh, Dorchester. Dorchester, I think. Uh, saying, dear Vincent Canby, you, and then four letter word. <laughs> and uh, how dare you to, to review my film when we haven't even started to shoot it. <laughs> uh, and so I wrote back on the same, just the back of his piece of paper and said, I think you're an idiot. Uh, that you, obviously I couldn't be reviewing the film and I, what if I was attempting to be funny and making fun not of you, but of the practice of reviewing films that aren't made yet. Sincerely yours. And about five months later, I got another note back saying, sorry or something like that. That, that was the extent. <laughs> it was also from the Dorchester. I don't know, I, he has a, a drop there, I think. <laughs> but uh, usually, and uh, we do get calls from uh, people who would like to sort of take you out and explain their upcoming film, and I try to avoid that kind of stuff because if you if you, it's very difficult to wrap somebody the film of somebody you've just had lunch with, uh, or who you know is you know hawked his house to pay for the film. Uh, you really are a rat when you do that. Okay, I'm gonna go through some of these audience questions here now. Do you have a set of criteria by which you judge each film, and are you partial to films that are unique in genre? Uh, quickly, no, no. <laughs> uh, no I, I, only to say that uh, I don't. I, I, I think it's very dangerous to, to sort of set up a checkoff list when you're looking at a movie because you, you can't respond to the film if you have, you know, Photography, uh, dialogue, uh, lighting, you, know, you can't do that when you're, and really respond to a movie the way you should. Uh, I like all you know, good movies of any genre are, are fine. Next question, which is related to this, do you enjoy panning a really bad film? No, I... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it was on the card. <laughs> No, if you get something, there are some films that are sort of fun to write about. Uh, I, there's a film that opened last Friday called Angel. <laughs> and that, that really is, you know, that is hilarious. It's so bad. Uh, and, that, and that's sort of stimulating. The, pro, the difficulty with writing reviews for a daily newspaper, though, is not 
uh, writing the bad reviews or the, the about films you like a lot. The problem is that most films are neither very bad or very good, and they are the ones that wear you out. Because there's nothing, you have no feeling about them one way or another, and you, you have to really push yourself to respond to them in the way that is going to make the reader want to read what you have to say about it. And as a result of seeing a lot of those films in a row, you can be much more you know, worn down than if you are working very hard at physical labor. They're, they're very, de they're in a way, kind of demeaning. Uh, that answer the question? I think so. Do you consider yourself a better playwright than a film critic or vice versa? Oh, I, have, I wouldn't risk a judgment, no. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, uh, we're having great problems right now in New Jersey, so I, wouldn't, I would hope a film critic. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Do you feel that the emergence of film school graduates, like from USC and NYU, have had positive or negative effects on, general, on the general quality of contemporary films? That's an interesting question, and I'm not sure. Uh, uh, for a while, I was sort of um, made uneasy by the huge numbers of, of graduates from film schools who were coming out, and there was nothing for them to do. And I feel a little bit about film schools the way about, I feel about uh, schools of journalism. I never went to a school of journalism, and I don't really think it's absolutely necessary to uh, go to a school of journalism. I happen to major in English. I wish I hadn't, because I think I would have I've gone just as far in, in reading and in picking up the knowledge I have if I'd uh, perhaps majored in philosophy or history or something, or become a lawyer. I think I still would have been a journalist. But I think these schools that specialize in, in, in such a particular way are not always absolutely necessary. And in films especially, the, so much of films, uh, what filmmaking is, has to do with technical knowledge, which, if necessary, you can pick up. Uh, nobody's going to teach you how to think interestingly, how to create from you know, order out of chaos, which is art. You're not going to learn that in a school ever. And a lot of people are coming out of these schools with uh, you know, lots of uh, know-how and nothing to, to uh, say or do. And we get, as a result, we get, I think this has something to do with a, a certain number of, of very flashy films that we get that are technically beautiful, but they're absolutely empty. They haven't got a, a thought in them. It reminds me of the line, I think it was the great documentary filmmaker John Grierson once said with reference to Joseph von Sternberg, when a great director dies, he becomes a photographer. <laughs> and uh, there's been a, a certain tendency that I've noticed too, where everything is put into the quality of the image and very little is left for consideration. Well, we were talking about El Norte. Uh, yeah. with, which both Annette, I think, and I like, and yet I think that ha that has some of the film school problems. It's a very pretty film, and it's uh, however it's beautiful without being really that pretty, and it it surmounts all its film school things he learned in film school. I think it's it's good in spite of that. Uh, They're UCLA graduates, and he uh, made a very interesting film. Did you ever see the? The Confessions, Confessions of Amman, yeah. which is a, a much more interesting film, and a film that wouldn't last five minutes, and it uh, didn't last five minutes when it was released here in 1977, but a, a very interesting original movie that yeah. was not a film school type movie at all. Pauline Kael once dramatically reversed herself in her criticism of Bonnie and Clyde. Have you ever regretted a published criticism or reconsidered a review? Well, first, it wasn't Pauline. She's never changed her mind. <laughs> uh, it was Joe Morgenstern who, who reversed himself on Bonnie and Clyde. Uh, I don't know what, I don't think I've ever done a flip like that. I, I've uh, sometimes gone back for whatever reason or seen a film that I've reviewed six months ago and gone back to see it. And usually I find that if, if there's any change, it's, the, it's my feeling that I either didn't praise it enough or overpraise certain aspects of it. I've never done a complete uh, reversal of opinion. Uh, it's usually just a, a, an awareness that perhaps I, didn't, I wasn't as accurate as I could have been and should have been. 
I was thinking too, you had mentioned in your roundup of the 10 best films of the year that, for example, Trading Places, oh, when yeah, it initially yeah. came out, you had raved unqualifiedly about, well, and then yeah, it didn't yeah. show up uh, yeah, on the 10 yeah. best list because there just becomes a question of relativity. I mean, well, that's the, the 10 best lists are, are terrible to make because it's totally arbitrary, really, what, what films make the top 10 as opposed to the follow up 10. And uh, it so happened that tra Trading Places just didn't qualify at, by the end of the year. Though it's, it's a film I still like a lot. But nice slapdash comedy. It's not a great movie. I wonder, though, to what extent, not just for 10 Best List, but even for Academy Award consideration or, or other prizes, is it important, the timing of releasing a film? For example, does a film that comes out, let's say, in December, have a truly better chance, not only for making 10 Best List, but of getting Oscar nominations? I think it does. I think it does. Uh, and there was a film, what was it? You'll remember about a year ago or two years ago that was released just to qualify oh, yes. for um, the Oscars, and, and it paid off. It got. I it, remember the story, but I don't remember the title. It played um, uh, the, one week, and then it yes, left and the, came back six to, months later. Uh, Deer Hunter, Deer you're Hunter, right. That's right. Right, and that paid off for them. But I think uh, most of the time, well, those qualifying dates don't necessarily haven't worked with any remar remarkable uh, consistency. However, um, I think films more recently seen obviously are you know, more in the forefront of the consciousness than films that have opened in January and February. Though this year, it's, this past year, it seemed to me there were a couple of extremely good films, King of Comedy, which I liked a lot, opened in February, and there was something else that, uh, uh, real quality, that opened early in the year that uh, most other people had forgotten by the time we got to the year end, you know? Well, I think, for me anyway, The Return of Martin Gare, yes, which opened yes, in June, was, in was sort summer, of yeah. a little bit forgotten yeah. by now, but... Uh, that's my <coughs> predilection. As long as you mentioned King of Comedy, I had one question here about it. Somebody was asking, I believe, do you think a brilliant film like King of Comedy was a commercial failure because it hit too close to home in our society? I doubt it. I, uh, I think, uh, for whatever reason, it's a very chilly movie. Uh, it's not a, a movie you go out humming the score of. <laughs> and it's the, the, when you have a leading character who is an absolute nut, and a rather spoo sp spooky nut, because, and one of the things that's so, uh, so interesting about that film is that you never know whether it's going to explode in your face and be a taxi driver. And that tension is really quite unbearable. And I think that it, it turned a lot of people off. And it's not the sort of movie, really, that people would urge their friends to see. It's a very nerve-wracking movie. And it's a brilliant movie. I think what it's about is very interesting. I, I like the script a lot, which is, happened to be written by an ex-film critic uh, for Newsweek, Paul Zimmerman. Uh, but I think that, that was a kind of film that I could almost have predicted would not do well. It, it is a scary movie, and it's scary not in a way that uh, people can go and giggle and eat popcorn. It really, it really turned them off, uh, turned the audience off. Yeah. Someone says, I often feel used by a film, do you? And how come critics very often do not talk about morality with respect to war exploitation films or crime films? Hmm. I think uh, we do talk about, talk about morality, but maybe not in terms that are immediately identifiable as moral terms. Uh, it, and it also depends, for me, on how the film works in toto. Uh, there are many films about really unpleasant subjects and including lots of unpleasant scenes that uh, I do not find as immoral as uh, oh, what sort of a dopey, uh, half-realized, uh, sentimental tearjerker of some sort. Uh, there's been a lot of discussion about Scarface uh, and I think legitimate discussion, because it's an extremely violent film, and people who don't go to films very often are absolutely amazed that this is allowed on screen. And yet, and this is where I've seen a lot of films, as I do, I may, some of us may become a tiny bit jaded, I don't think we are, but I was not offended by Scarface, for two reasons. I mean, I, I, I 
I think I'm familiar with Brian De Palma's work, so I had perhaps saw it with an edge that other people just coming off the street wouldn't have. Brian De Palma is perhaps the most satirical filmmaker in America today. And I wouldn't, really wouldn't know that if I hadn't seen his very early independent films, which are hilarious movies, Hi Mom and Greetings. Then he slid into the sort of Grand Guignol uh, phase, which uh, I was not crazy about. I was sort of interested in what he was doing, but I had a feeling that he was just out to, you know, to make the big time, which he did. And Scarface, it seems to me, the, is the first film he's made that has the satirical uh, quality of his very early small films, and some of the sort of the bravura of his uh, Grand Guignol films. I think it's an extremely interesting film, but I also know that you go in to see it at the, wherever it's playing on 42nd Street and you're taking your life in your hands. I mean, it's, it's answering all sorts of needs which horrify me. But I'm, I'm not, I don't think I'm really qualified to discuss that. I'm not a psychologist or a psychiatrist. And somebody, somebody else has to deal with that aspect of the film and all I can do as the critic is to describe it as vividly as possible so that nobody goes in there thinking they're seeing you know Mickey Mouse and uh, you know the Christmas Carol and that's that's all I want to do and I, I, I am reluctant to to become morally uh, uh, upright or you know, morally outraged uh, because all of us have different sets of morals among other things and as a film critic, my job is to describe the film as accurately as possible so that if people with other standards will understand what the film is like and be able to make up their own mind. That actually relates to a question that I've got here. Um, how damaging is it to the credibility of the critic, in quotes, when you have several well-received critics at complete opposite ends of the spectrum with a film such as Scarface or The Wild Bunch? I don't think it's damaging at all. I thank God that we all don't write alike, and I should think you all would too. Uh, what a boring world. Uh, if we all had absolutely the same opinions and thought that the, you know, all the, had the uh, exact, uh, repeated each other in our uh, outrage or in our praise for each succeeding movie, I think much more, what, what it's kind of frightening is the critical, uh, uh, idea that you know films are there's just there is a one right opinion about a film and one wrong opinion and if you deviate from that you're either out or you're in or whatever it's too too silly and too too small and what it, what it all comes down to really is opinion mongering that is just out hustling opinions it's not what you're how you write it or what you say or the wit or the interest or the passion that you bring to your writing which is what written criticism is about, not necessarily the, the, the opinion expressed about a particular film. And that leads to another one. I'm trying to put these together. What is most critical to the development of a young critic? Your advice, please. How important is journalism reporting to criticism? I think everybody sort of arrives at the kind of job I have, you know, by in by chance to begin with, I never set out to be a, a film critic. I can only, but I'll, uh, my own path was sort of uh, checkered. I always wanted to be a, a, a writer, and then that sort of narrowed down to being a, a journalist. I think when I was about six, I tried to write my first novel, and didn't get beyond the second paragraph, which hung me up for about forty years. Uh, <laughs> Then I went back and wrote the second paragraph and couldn't finish it. But uh, I've always uh, I've been working on newspapers all my life, and from the time when I was at Dartmouth, I've been reviewing films and always somehow wound up uh, somehow either covering films as a reporter or reviewing them. And I, it's nothing I set out to do. And I sort of uh, I just hope that nobody, you know, but below the age of 19 has already set his cap to be a critic. I think there's much more to do in life and much more to learn. If you start thinking you're going to be passing in judgment all the time, I don't think you're going to learn enough about the, the world first. And uh, it's, again, that goes back 
what I'm saying about journalism schools or film schools. I wish all schools were uh, required everybody to to uh, take a straight liberal arts. Not all school. I mean, uh, all students. Are, but I wish I'd. Uh, I wish I hadn't uh, been an English major. There are fields that I think could have been much more helpful to me. From the written word to the media, what is your opinion of TV film critics? Uh, I mean, the people on television. I gather. Uh, I think. I think the person is referring to the people who review films on television. Uh, well, I think uh, the only one I really know, and I, I like him personally, is Gene Shalit. I don't see him very often because I don't get up that early. But uh, <laughs> uh, I don't see them. I see their quotes in the in the film ads, and I hope they're as embarrassed by theirs as I am by mine. <laughs> yeah. They're terrible. <laughs> uh. Total opposite end of the spectrum. How important is it for you to keep up with current film theory? Why is it that newspaper and magazine critics often don't incorporate film theory into film criticism? I suppose that we're rather limited in space. I'm not, it, I mean that in newspaper space. Um, we, on newspapers, are really uh, carrying on or uh, it's an extra what we do is an, uh, is another function of the daily newspaper which is to report what happened yesterday and if you go back and uh, look at the collected times film reviews which started I think in 1913 you'll see that we sort of edged into film criticism via the news story the first film reviews in the times were news stories about oh for instance the opening of uh, birth of a nation and it's covered as a news story about who was there. And uh, then it, about the third paragraph, it talks a little bit about how the, uh, the, the image on the screen was really quite clear. You could read the titles very easily. And the story was about this and that. And that was the end of that. Was our, those were our first film reviews. And I think daily newspaper film criticism is still uh, a report on not on what happened yesterday because we're now reviewing the films the day they open but it's, it's a it's a news report that is the initial function of a review in a daily newspaper which is different from a weekly magazine and certainly far different from a quarterly and I mean for instance when we review films we cannot assume that the reader has seen it which is sometimes very inhibiting if you're writing about certain kinds of films and you are not allowed to write about the entire movie. Uh, whereas somebody writing about films in a quarterly can assume that the, his readers have seen the film, they can talk, write about film theory, and have a great deal more space than we do. No? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, question is, do you believe we get to see the best of foreign film product? And this is read the release of La Balance and Entre Nous, and not of Bresson's L'Argent. I, I, that's a very particular case. Uh, Bresson is one of the great ones, and he makes films that are just so, so difficult for even the, the most altruistic distributors to handle, because they, there are about maybe 200 of us <coughs> who think he's the greatest, one of the great filmmakers of all time, and after those 200 people have seen his films, the theater is absolutely empty. And we, if we all go on the same day, you know, that's it. <laughs> and I, L'Argent is, I hope, I hope very much that that will be released. Uh, it was at the film festival, and I think it's one of his greatest. It's just a beautiful, beautiful movie. Did you like it? Yeah. I admired it without liking it. Well, the, the, he's a kind of filmmaker you, you do admire often more than you really, you can't warm up to him. No. I mean, and that's part of what a Bresson film is. Yeah. And makes him... Unique. Even incidentally at the Cannes Film Festival, which is where I saw L'Argent and where supposedly very sophisticated film goers are seated, half of the audience was booing and half of the audience was applauding during the film. Yeah, I mean, there was a total dichotomy in, in the hall. <coughs> they are <What>? frivolous. <laughs> And there was no popcorn here. What effect, if any, do you think the superstars who write, produce, and direct movies, such as Barbara Streisand, Alan Ola, Clint Eastwood, will ultimately have on the movies? Do you think the increasing power of actors and actresses will be detrimental? 
Well, if Barbara is left to go on her own, she may ruin Hollywood, but I, uh, I don't think the others will. Uh, that was the longest movie I've ever seen in my life. You like it? I like that one without admiring it. <laughs> no, I admire it. I admire it. Oh. To each his own. Well, actually, that leads to oh. another question, which um, actually is like what we're having. Somebody wrote, I have extreme difficulty in appreciate I have extreme difficulty in appreciating Woody Allen's work. Further, I find your comments vis-a-vis -vis Woody quite incomprehensible. Have you a rational explanation of our differences, or are we committed to complete subjectivity as the only rationale? No. <laughs> it was there, you know, I just picked it up. <clears throat> No, subject, no, that's, a, that's an intelligent question because subject, any critic who says he isn't subjective is crazy. Okay. Uh, question is, I noticed a change in your attitudes and what pleases you now seems quite different than a few years back. Is that something you're consciously aware of? It's, and someone else has a similar question. How do you see yourself as a critic having evolved over your years at the Times? I don't know that I've changed that much. I think there are th some things that I was much more... Uh, tolerant of when I started than I am now. And that would have been, I think, simply because I hadn't seen as much. Uh, there are certain kinds of pretentiousness like, or, or, or films that I just, uh, I have very little patience with now that I would have uh, you know, try, stretched to, to comprehend before. And I, I just haven't got the time now. I've seen too much uh, nonsense to waste time trying to wrench myself into an attitude that's more uh, receptive. There, there are certain kinds of uh, uh, European films, I, I don't know how, maybe it would help me to describe them, like The Moon in the Gutter, uh, the, the kind of, uh, the uh, Antonioni film we were talking about at supper tonight, the... Uh, Identification uh, of a Woman. Yes, that, uh, and uh, another, uh, Antonioni, or no, Visconti film that was a huge or very respectable hit, especially in Paris, the conversation piece, which didn't last a minute over here, and it, 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 it represents a kind of uh, intellectual approach to filmmaking that is really uh, middle brow at heart, and the French love. And uh, The Moon in the Gutter is, is another one of the same sort, I think. Yeah, although The Moon in the Gutter, of course, um, was lambasted to a great extent by the French critics and audiences, and I think... I don't know. I should have loved it. They should have. <laughs> nasty, I, don't know. I can't tell the difference. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I think that part of this, I mean, just my own opinion, because I go to France a lot and I try to figure out how the situations for filmmakers there differ from here, it has something to do with the big name theory of filmmaking. In other words, because Jean-Jacques Benex made a big hit with Diva, two things happened. Number one, a lot of producers were willing to give him more money and freedom to completely have whatever he wanted to do on his next one, which meant self-indulgence could result. And number two, French critics and other filmmakers were dipping their pens in vitriol, just waiting for that film to come out so they could lambast it because partly of jealousy and partly because they felt the success of Diva, particularly in the United States, was undeserved. With Antonioni, Visconti, and the others, I think part of it is just, well, sometimes the emperor's new clothes. I mean, the assumption, well, again... An both Antonioni and, and Visconti have made great films. They've also made just terrible films. But the assumption is, and it's part of the new wave problem I was discussing earlier, you figure, oh, it's a Visconti film, I guess it's gotta be wonderful even yeah. if I don't understand yeah. it. Yeah. And a lot of people subscribe to that for lack of their own faith, right. Right. you know, in their own convictions. But I, I can't really explain it any better than okay. anyone else. Okay, good. Ha, well. You did very well. <laughs> Thank you. <clears throat> what are your Oscar predictions for best movie, best actor, and best actress? I felt we had to bring it down a little here. <laughs> I have any idea, because when people ask me questions like that, I can't remember any titles. Uh, I was amazed that, uh, did, was Terms of Endearment named the best film by the New York Film Critics? Yes. Which you know, I find incredible, because I, I like, it's a nice movie, but I can't think of it as the best film of the year. Uh, nice performances too, and I bet, I should think Shirley MacLaine and Deborah Winger will both be nominated. 
And I would, uh, actually, I think Shirley MacLaine, this is one of the few times I think it's her, it's, you know, she's about due for something like that, and she may well win the award. Uh, I don't, I, I think over Meryl Streep, who's won twice recently. Mm -hmm. And it works, you know, that's the way they vote out there. You know, then. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Have you ever considered reviewing theater and drama instead of film? Why film only? Well, when I first went to uh, the Times, I was the third string critic in just about everything. I even uh, covered a fire <laughs> and a murder, too. Uh, but when I first went to the Times, I covered theater, uh, third string, off off Broadway stuff. And that was back in the days before Stanley Kaufman, and we had to come back to the office at, uh, we, the curtain would go up at 7 and we'd get out at 9 or 9.30 and have to have our piece in by 10.20. And that is the worst experience in the world, try to write a piece in 40 minutes. Uh, it, it puts a strain on you that is terrible because you, just as soon as you get into the theater, before the lights have gone down or the curtain has gone up, you're writing your first paragraph. And that's not natural. <laughs> Many films being produced today are based on works in modern literature. These films usually, I'm sorry, I'm missing a word here, so expose, expose, I don't know, on, un on unique characters who somehow do not fit society's norms. Some example are Ordinary People, Sophie's Choice, Rubin, Rubin, and Yentl. Do you like to read such works before seeing the film? And how much responsibility does the filmmaker bear to not deviate too far from the original work? Uh, I, if it's something like War and Peace or Hamlet or uh, Remembrance of Things Past, I think one should have some idea of what the original work is. <laughs> uh, if it's a, is it Charles Ludlam? Or who's the, who, who, does, who does the? The Theater of the Ridiculous? No, no, I'm thinking of the, the guy who does suspense novels. Yes, yes. I don't feel the need to uh, read those. I think we should. Uh, we should know what we're dealing with, if only to know, if, if somebody, if Barbara Streisand wants to do Macbeth. <laughs> uh, I'm serious. <laughs> no, I think one should make it a point of reading Macbeth and try to figure out why she wants to put her, you know, wants to fool around with it. Uh, I, I, there's, it, it, it there are times when it is required, other times I don't think it is. Uh, the, what is important always, really, for the film critic is what's on the screen. And if we do too much research, uh, it's possible not to see what's actually on the screen, but just to see everything that you, as a critic, would, had anticipated would be there and, and isn't, and you get kind of mixed up in your, your reaction to it. Uh, and. After all, what we're supposed to be writing about initially is the film itself. And uh, secondarily, and it's a legitimate thing to discuss, is why would Barbara Streisand want to make a film out of Macbeth? You know, it should be discussed. Okay. <laughs> How do you explain the overwhelming box office success of Rear Window and Vertigo? And that, there was another related question. Does this mean that films really were so much better then? Well, it means that Hitchcock's films were terrific, and they were, and they are, and they will be for a very long time. Also, Rear Window and Vertigo are two of his very best. Uh, he's a master, and I think we've understood that for some time. The excitement of, about Rear Window and Vertigo has something to do with the fact that both films were not available recently. Uh, for me, I think Rear Window is one of his top three or four, and what, in addition to the fact that it's a, just a most entertaining, witty movie, is th to see how great the color was in the print, which I understand actually is, an, is one of the original prints. Mm -hmm. And those Technicolor prints do not fade. And yet you can go to the, uh, see a uh, you know, second run of the right stuff and it looks as if, the print looks as if it were 40 years old. It's all pink, maybe, mm -hmm. which is too bad because of the old Technicolor, three color process prints are extraordinary and they will last with luck. The, the, all other color films that you're now seeing in the theaters are gonna be a, a pale pink in, in, within eight years.
And that's terrible. Hmm. We have time for just uh, two or three more questions. Do you go to the movies when you're on vacation? <laughs> Not often. <laughs> uh, Usually I'm someplace where there are no movie theaters, so that is not a problem. I keep myself inside, but I would be running off to the theater. No, I, I don't. No. Okay. Why do you think there are so few women directors? I suppose it's a prejudice. It's, you know, it's a historical prejudice. Uh, there, throughout the history of movies, there have been individual women who've made it. And why that hasn't uh, allowed... Uh, others to, to uh, follow uh, as often as they are now. And we're getting more and more today, and you probably have more ideas about that than I do. Because uh, aside from Dorothy uh, Arsner, I don't know who came between her and uh, some of the ones we have today. Well, Ida Lupino, because she was an actress, yes. and um, well, there was Lois Weber further back. And right. then we had a whole bunch of them a few years ago that seemed to be making inroads like Lee Grant and Joan Tewksbury and Joan yeah. McQuinn Silver. But now it seems really from foreign countries like France that most of the women directors are emerging. Um, that would take too long, I think, to explain right now. Right, right. okay. Um, is there something called an American film? And if so, what are its elements? I can't imagine, uh, films today are so mixed up as far as their, you know, the, the, uh, the people who contribute to it. Uh, Nestor Almendros, who's one of the great uh, cinematographers, is a Cuban who works in, who is uh, probably a French citizen now, isn't he? Yeah, I think so. And who often works here on American films. Sven Nykvist is another one. He's a Swede who shoot, often shoots American films. So many of the, tec uh, the technical credits on, uh, well, the Star Wars films are English. Uh, films, even though they may look American, are seldom are entirely American, and this is one of the interesting things of, about movies. I suppose the only, uh, I don't know if there is such a thing as an American film. I mean, if you go back to the, the 30s uh, and the great influx of uh, middle European and German filmmakers in Hollywood, I mean, they made what we now think of as the American film, and a lot of them could hardly speak English, and they made some of the greatest American films ever made. The, the uh, Lubish, uh, Billy Wilder, uh, Michael Curtiz. Otto Preminger. Preminger, yes. Uh, so that I don't know what it, uh, if there is such a thing as an American film. I'd be hard put to define what it is. Okay, here you've got a little love note. The review of Angel was a classic. I cut it out and filed it for posterity. Thanks. And uh, finally, three people asked, what are your favorite films of all time? A few that stand out in your memory. Uh, that's, you know, that's, that's it. Um, Magnificent Ambersons would be one. That I, and they're not necessarily the best, but the ones that if I, I think to be or not to be, Lubitsch would be one, and also the uh, uh, Howard Hawks 20th Century, which is, I think, maybe the funniest movie ever made. Um, Rear Window would be one. Uh, Discreet Charles Bourgeoisie. I mean, there are, there are any number that uh, I'd be perfectly happy to see right this minute. Well, throw in one Truffaut, and then I'll let you go. Oh <laughs> my God! I mean, all well, Jules and Jim, uh, Stolen Kisses, Wild Child, Four Bros. Right. Now it's okay. <laughs> Okay. In any case, I'm sorry that I could not get to some of the cards from people in the audience. I'd like to thank you all for coming, and thank you, Vincent Kennedy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for listening. For more information on the 92nd Street Y New York and all of our programs, please visit us at 92ny.org.